suddenly warming up. I'm, I'm happy may it be 72 to 84 for months on end, right? Well, let's open in prayer. Our Father, um, we thank you that you're our Father. You hold us in your arms. You love us deeply, more than we could even comprehend. With parenting comes discipline, Lord, and each time you give us a task and um, bring us into a fellow further discipleship through discipline. We thank you for that. Lord, this morning we're going to learn about one of um, your son's good, good friends, Mary of Bethany. We thank you for that relationship. We thank you that your son freely um, welcomed women into his discipleship. And Lord Jesus, may we sit at his feet and honor you in the same way. We bless you, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Okay, Jeannie, you started me off crying. I blame you. If I, if I become, my face gets streaked with black. Mary of Bethany. So I'm going to ask you all, who was Mary of Bethany? Sister, sister of Martha and Lazarus. Okay. What else, what else is she known for? The nard, okay. Her gentleness. Her gentleness, okay. You know, it's interesting, Mary of Bethany, a lot of these women in scripture, we know about them, a little bit about them, but once again, I think um, uh, my, my husband included, most men who are preachers or teachers, they teach from what they know, so they teach from the man's perspective, so they often teach on men. And it's um, really lovely for women to engage scripture, both men and women, um, from a woman's perspective. You know, because God made us women, did it purposefully. There were two in the garden, and, and they were great, just as they are. Um, so let's, uh, let's look at who Mary of Bethany was, because I think we're going to learn some things about her. First of all, we're going to look, be looking at which gospels she's in, what's going on, who's involved, where are they, what is our common cultural perception of the story. Um, I'm going to go through some of these first slides fast because I want to really get into the meat. Where is Bethany? So we know that Bethany is, see, way down at the bottom. There's a little black, uh, blue square. It says Bethany. And then right, see the star next to it? It says Jerusalem. And I want you to notice that up at Capernaum, that's where, and around the Sea of Galilee, that's where Jesus did most of his work. That's where most of the Gospels have happened, right? Um, he was born, does it have Bethlehem on here? Uh, the next one does. But that's, that's the trajectory. That's pretty much where Jesus traveled back and forth in between those okay, areas. So we're down here at Bethany. It's right by the sea, uh, I mean the Dead Sea. Here you see it a little bit better. Uh, Bethlehem, you see Bethlehem south. So that's where Jesus was born. They traveled all the way from Nazareth up at the top, all the way down to Bethlehem um, for Mary to give birth. But so this is their little circle they're in. Um, you see where Bethany is. Ducky? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. I, just, I like maps. Yes. And, uh, how far would it be from the top, what was it, Capernaum, uh -huh. down to say um, Bethany? It's about 30 miles. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's pretty much, you know, as we travel around the world right now, and we, or we think we don't get out of our little sphere much, um, I probably, I travel more in a day than Jesus distance-wise traveled his whole life, with the exception of when they went off to Egypt. So, Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Um, we will be looking. You see Bethany over here on the side? I'm looking here, but you guys can see. It's on the far right side as you're looking. Uh, you see the Mount of Olives, the Jericho Road, Garden of Gethsemane. You see where that is? The Temple Mount. Do you see how it all is all laid out? So now we have our setting. So we know where we're situated in this. It's about a day's walk from Bethany to Gethsemane. OK? OK, first of all, um, the city of Bethany, it's in Matthew. We're just going to kind of go through things a couple times. 
um, Matthew 21 and 26, kind of later in the text, and it's at the very end. Um, it talked about when here a woman, not named, uh, came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on him. So she's an unnamed woman. She's, she's not Mary Bethany. She's an unnamed woman, but this happens in Bethany. Um, and while he was at the house of Simon the leper, right? So two people you don't normally hang out with if you're a religious leader, right? A leper and a woman. <laughs> in Mark, um, we, this is again toward the end. Now, uh, Jesus' ministry happened all up here. He's turned. He's making his way down. We'll see that better in Luke. Um, it's right before the triumphal entry. So this, we're talking Palm Sunday, the weekend of Palm Sunday, Okay. Um, now when they drew near to Jerusalem, Bethpage and Bethany, that's where they are. He, they're just situating them. He's situ Mark is situating this, it. Um, in Mark 11, you see, and 14. Uh, again, in Mark 14, there's an unnamed woman with costly nard, co uh, alabaster jar of costly nard, and she anoints him. Uh, this time she pours it over his head. So one time it's over his, her feet, now it's over her head. It's the same story, different views from different corners of the street. Um, Luke, one of the things in, um, about Luke that's so great is you see he's, he's gone up, he's doing his ministry, and then he literally turns his face toward Jerusalem in Luke 9. That's when he basically knows he's going to die. And that happens in Luke 9. And the whole rest of Luke 9 is Jesus traveling from the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum area, Capernaum area down to Jerusalem where he knows he will be killed. Okay? So that's what happens in Luke 9. Luke 19, when he, drew, when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples out. And that's where he's going, they're going out to find donkey, a donkey for him to ride out. Um, oh, I have John in there. I'm not sure how John get in there. Pretend like that's not there, right? So then we go down to 24 in the ascension. Um, he led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. That's at the very, very end. It's not, he hasn't ascended yet, but that's where he's going for the ascension, okay? It's out by Bethany. Now we'll go back up to John because we'll see John in a minute. Um, uh, um, he gets back um, right there. That's where and he gets baptized by John the Baptist, is near Bethany, by the River Jordan, okay? According to John. Oh, there we are. Um, but I want to show you, it's Bethany across the Jordan. So remember when we, let me, oh, whoops. I got to get my, right, my arrows going the right direction. I want to show you this. So see where it says up here, you have Bethany down there, Qumran, and then Bethany beyond the Jordan. It's on the, just up, just to the right, it says Mount Nebo, that's right below, be, below. That is the Bethany where he was baptized, near that Bethany. There are two Bethanies. One's beyond the Jordan, on the other side of the Jordan River, and one is the Bethany that he's in. So sometimes... We get, get things confused, and I just wanted to separate that there are two Bethanies that we're talking about. We'll always um, need to distinguish between those. Then we have the death of Lazarus. It's all John 11. is all about the death of Lazarus. Uh, and what you need to know about John 11 is called the raising of Lazarus. Lazarus is like the, um, the side attraction. The whole of John 11 is about Jesus's interaction with Martha and Mary. And we'll see that. And Martha gets the bulk of that text, right? Then in John 12, the woman who anoints him is finally named. Six days before the Passover, right before the triumphal entry, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was and whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And that's where we see Mary anointing, okay? So this is the big picture. We'll go deep in um, as we move forward. I've already shown you that. OK, uh, quick in Luke. Um, so there's a bit in Luke 7 that, uh, that's a little confusing that also has a woman. She's the woman that, that, that anoints his feet, anoints Jesus' feet. She's an unnamed woman. Uh, here I was just doing my 
you know how Luke always has a woman for a man, man for a woman. Leading up to this passage, he heals a centurion servant, and then he resurrects the widow's son of Nain, couplet. He, he has messengers of John the Baptist, so he's talking to them. And then this, there's a sinful woman forgiven, and he talks about forgiveness in both of those passages. So once again, Luke's doing his great talk about inclusion. <laughs> it's in the Gospel of Luke, and I love it. But this is a separate incident that nobody quite knows what to do with. And they don't know, Luke was one of the, um, he was the only one that wasn't present at the, with, with Jesus. So he's learning most of this secondhand through Paul. Matthew, Mark, and John were all there, right? So Luke is learning secondhand. And we don't know if Luke is hearing this story and kind of fits it in here or gets confused about timing. Uh, I'm, we're not quite sure what happens with Luke because it could be Mary of Bethany, but this seemed to be more about forgiving this woman rather than anointing Jesus for burial, which is what we see connected going on in Bethany, okay? Uh, here's Luke 10. So we've, um, oh, another, another thing about the Luke 7 verse, right after, in Luke 36 to 53, I think it is, that's when we see that story of the woman coming in to the Pharisee's house. So he's at a Pharisee's house, not Simon the leper's house, and they're dining, and she washes his feet with her hair, right, and her tears. Um, right after that chapter is Luke 8, and that's where we get Mary Magdalene introduced. 8 Luke 8, verse 3, who was healed of seven demons. And she, along with Johan, Joanna and several others, supported Jesus' ministry. Okay, These are the women that gave the money that made Jesus' ministry possible. And they followed him as a disciple, but they were not one of the inner 12. 12 disciples? It's 12 disciples, right? Right. I've been talking about 10 a lot with my other Bible study that I'm doing, so I get my numbers mixed up. Um, so what happened, what's happened in the popular, in the mind of the popular culture is that the woman, sinful woman in Luke chapter 7 is conflated with Mary Magdalene that's named in chapter 8. So for 2,000 years, Mary becomes, Mary Magdalene becomes the one with the nard. So it gets really confusing. She's not distinguished. And it goes even further. Uh, you'll see it tracked Irenaeus, Origen, all the early church fathers, continually to take all the unnamed women and kind of make them into one person. Okay? And you think, why would they do that? They're individual women. You have to know they're thinking with a, with a pre-medieval, kind of a, the ancient world mindset, mindset, first of all, and then the medieval mindset. And those mindsets were not really big on actual factual accuracy for storytelling a lot of the time, okay? That happened with the Enlightenment, where we became fact-driven, and now science is king, like, right? Science right now is king, despite the fact that science, you can make science do what, exactly what you want it to do in some ways, right? So what happened, um, Gregor the Great, in his Easter sermon in 593, he was having trouble with the religious houses behaving because they were looking at Mary, who at that time was never sinned, never sinned. she was perfect, virginal, she'd never done anything wrong, and she, their, in their ideology she'd assumed into heaven. And Jesus, those were their two figures, and they had a real problem, Worsh they would worship those two figures, but they couldn't relate to them because they were sinless. And the nuns and the monks that were in those early church houses that were taking over the early middle dark ages, they weren't sin sinless people. In fact, <laughs> there was a lot of fraternizing between the monks and the nuns, and there was a lot of guilt that was happening. And so they were leaving the religious life and, and leaving 
um, God and the, the Bible completely because they thought, well, I've failed. I can't do that. So what Gregory the Great did is he scooped together all the unnamed women of the Bible, women at the well, the women who, uh, basically all the Mary of Bethany figures, any, any woman that wasn't named. She became Mary Magdalene, the sinner of sinners, the woman caught in adultery that was going to get stoned. All of these people, they were all Mary Magdalene. He just conflated them all. And he did that by saying, who did Jesus resurrect and show himself to first? In particular, Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. John 20 is all Mary Magdalene. She was the first one to see him alive. If you're going to be in the ancient world and you're going to reveal yourself to somebody, you don't pick a woman. You pick a man, right? You probably pick Herod. He'd be more reliable than Mary Magdalene, right? But Gregor the Great was saying, if Mary Magdalene could be this sinful woman, but then by following Jesus could be so redeemed that he was the first one he showed himself to, it shows there's no depth of sin that you can engage in that can't be forgiven and you honored and valued as a princess by Jesus, okay? So that's a little aside. That's what was going on with Mary Magdalene. That's why she gets conflated into the woman with the nard. In all painting, you know Mary Magdalene, she's a little cheat. I did a, a degree on Mary Magdalene. So I spent like four years with her. Um, and I looked at a lot of art with her in it. And she's always in red. She's always got long golden or kind of reddish golden hair. And she always has her nard, right? Her little jar of nard, which is actually Mary of Bethany. But it doesn't matter because in the iconic, icon, iconography and in the visual mind of people, most of whom could not read up until about the 17th or 18th century, they saw these images and knew it was Mary Magdalene. Okay, that, they knew that, who they were talking about. And it was this Gregory the Great, the most sinful woman on the planet, was the one who Jesus revealed himself to first. So that redemptive power of Jesus is contained. So every time you see Mary Magdalene now in her red cloak with her long golden hair uncovered, which you have to keep your head covered as a woman, and that little bit of nard, you know it's Mary Magdalene they're painting, and you know what they're trying to communicate with that painting. Okay. We didn't get to do Mary Magdalene, so I had to get her in there somewhere, right? I love her. All right, back to Mary of Bethany, who was the real woman with the, with the jar of nard, the alabaster jar of nard. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. So remember, they've turned in chapter 9. They've turned, and they're coming down. Um, and a woman named Martha welcomed in her into her house, welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. This is the story we know, right? But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Anybody heard that story before? We all. And we've all gone through that. I'm more Mary. I'm more Martha. I want to be more Mary. I don't want to be. And let me tell you, in the medieval period, in the Renaissance period, there were books and books and books about the virtues of Martha and the virtues of Mary. Every nunnery um, had the Mary Martha like thing going on there, right? It was huge. It, they were bestsellers, right? As, as you write on vellum with, by hand, they were, they were big, these two. They shaped people's lives. Um, most of the time, it was translated, Mary has chosen the better way. Right? Has, have you heard that? Moses, Mary's chosen the better way. I just naturally assumed that that's what it said. But that's not what it says. It says the good portion. Martha is pulling together portions to feed Jesus, but Mary has chosen 
the true good portion. Do you see how that spins things differently? He's not shaming Martha. He's saying, you are giving me, you want to serve me and give me food, but I'm giving Mary the really good food. Does that flip that at all for you? When I read, looked at that, it was a good portion. You mean it doesn't say better way? I spent like three days looking this up and trying to figure out what was going on. So good portion, agathos means admirable, and portion, meris, or merese, means assigned part, portion, or share. And that's exactly what Jesus was doing. He was serving her the best slice of cake where Martha was running around trying to figure out how to serve Jesus. What do we give Jesus? We can give him some great things. What does Jesus give us? <laughs> really good things. If you had a choice between me giving you something or Jesus giving you something, which would you pick? I won't be offended. If you picked me, we'd have to have some talking to, all right? This has been, this is not that Martha was the busybody and Mary was the good disciple thing. That's not what's happening here. It's what we give God pales in comparison to what God gives us. Does that make sense? Right? My, my little head blew when I realized that that's what was going on. But it's not the better way, it's the good portion. All right? Um, just so you know, um, I, I hoped you know that Lazarus wasn't really mentioned in that passage, right? It was just Martha and her sister Mary. You always mention the first, the most important person first when you're introducing anybody in a list of people in scripture. And so, Intro, whoever you're introducing first, that's the most important person, right? Okay, please know that. Um, and I just want, I wanted to take a minute out to show, no, there was no man other than Jesus in that picture, right? Lazarus wasn't there. Lazarus wasn't even mentioned. Jesus is in a house with two women. Well, at that time, no rabbi would have carried on a conversation with a woman in an inn or not even with his sister or daughter on account of what men may think. Right? A man shall not talk with a woman in the street, nor even with his own wife, especially not with another woman, on account of what one may say. That comes from rabbinic studies. In that time, men didn't talk to women publicly. They still don't do it in the Middle East in the Islamic religion. Or they, well, they may even do it here now. Men don't, you certainly don't go into a woman's house when there are only two women there and sit down by yourself. Now, he may have had the disciples with him. It doesn't say he did. You don't do that. What was Jesus doing? It was scandalous what he was doing. Um, Rabbi Eleazar is quoted in Leon Morris's. He's fabulous. If you ever get a um, uh, commentary by Leon Morris, he's great. Perhaps the greatest blot on the rabbinic attitude to women was that though rabbis held the study of the law to be the greatest good in life, they discouraged women from studying it at all. If any man gives uh, his daughter a knowledge of the law, it is as though he taught her lechery. Now today, people don't understand what lechery means. I'm hoping you women do, right? You, you don't teach women the law. What was Jesus doing? Teaching Mary in an incredibly intimate setting She's at his feet. Hopefully she had her hair covered. If she didn't, ugh, it would have been like, woof. You don't do this. This Luke, including this scene, it's not included in the other, in the other books. Luke, including the scene, <laughs> it's like saying, well, my husband went down to a strip club and evangelized a woman while she was sitting on his lap, kind of thing. Like, that's the, that's the connotation this has. Right? Sure, he did. Somebody was evangelizing, but... 
So for him to do this, and for Luke to include that, it's not included in the other Gospels. They were still protecting Jesus. And Jesus is like, I don't need protecting. Luke, you write this. All right? Um, now we get to John 11. Okay, so John, the beloved disciple, the disciple that Jesus had that followed him, he was the younger one. He's often painted without a beard. He was the one that so many people mistook as Mary Magdalene in when that big um, phase, what was that um, movie that came out? There's a book that came out um, that said that Jesus actually married Mary Magdalene and there was this whole controversy. Right? You may not know that. I did because I was in Mary Magdalene land for four years. So um, he's often painted and depicted without a beard um, and he's often depicted like cuddling into Jesus. He's one of the three that closest disciples. He's writing, uh, he's the one that starts, as, as you know, um, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, right? So uh, he's writing to a different group, not necessarily the Jews. Uh, so this, prior to this, I think we'd had the story of the Good Samaritan, and then we have this. He's, they're very definitely, Jesus has done his ministry. He's down and is, is the weekend before, in this scene, is the weekend before Palm Sunday. So he's had three years of ministry. And now he's in the weekend before Palm Sunday. He knows he's got a week. He's got about a week to live. Now, a certain man was ill, and Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and his sister Martha. So who's the most important person there? Lazarus. He's doing it the right way, well, how all Jews should do it. Uh, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. But it's the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Lazarus of Bethany, but it's whose village? Mary's and Martha's. That's interesting. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. But we haven't gotten to John 12 yet. John 12 is where Mary anoints Jesus and wipes him with her hair, wipes his feet with her hair. Okay, so he's kind of foreshadowing this, we think whose brother Lazarus was ill. So we know Mary and Martha. We don't know Lazarus. In the public psyche of these three, the people they know are Mary and Martha. Lazarus was like a recluse. I don't know what he was, but he wasn't the main event. He was their brother, and that's how he was known, in their village. So, he, so the sisters sent to him, Jesus, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Obviously, he loves Lazarus. They've had a relationship. They know each other. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that, no, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. He's using really messianic language here. And he's saying this out loud. He's up here. They're down here. He's on his way down, but he hasn't gotten there yet. Okay? Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Why would you just say it that way? So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed, he stayed two days longer, which is what you do when you hear that somebody is really ill, Right? <laughs> in place where he was. And then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. So he hadn't quite made it to Judea at this time. He was still up. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going to go there again? I think they're up in Samaria at this point. Which, yeah, they had been in Samaria because uh, they had been in Samaria. OK, so it's a dangerous place. And the disciples are like, what are you doing? Right? 
After saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I, will, I go to awaken him. Can you imagine being the disciples? They're like, what? Are you like, they want to kill you down there? You heard about it two days ago and you waited. So clearly you didn't care. And now all of a sudden you care when it's prime killing you time. What? He's asleep, but it's all about glorifying the son of God. And now he's fallen asleep, but you'll go wake him up. But he was sick two days ago. Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. Now, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest and sleep. And then Jesus told them plainly, okay, I'll be, I'll be frank with you all. Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, must have been a twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. That's saying something. They know he's going to die. And they still think he's a revolutionary. They're still waiting for the arms, the fight, the battle. And he's like, okay, let's go. Let's go die with him. He hasn't been training them in battle. He's been training them in something very different, right? A different sort of battle. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So they're surrounded by, Jewish, by the Jewish people now. Martha and Mary are being consoled. He's been in the tomb for four days. Four days. Locked in a rock. All the spices around him. There's nothing good that's going to come out of that tomb, right? Even if he had been alive still, he had no air, no water. You can only live for three days without water. He's dead. And the Jewish Jews are around him. Around. Lots of people coming to mourn with them. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. So Martha gets up and runs out. Mary, nope, Jesus didn't come. I'm staying here. Now this is Mary that chose the good portion. And this is Martha that always was trying to figure out how to serve Jesus. Martha runs, Mary stays. Rules are a little flipped here, in my opinion. The interesting thing, that Luke passage, that's only seven verses. Martha here, I'm going to talk about Martha just a bit. She gets about a whole, she gets about half of a chapter, almost a whole chapter. And we remember Martha for being the busybody, no good, very bad, chose the wrong portion. This is how we should remember her. Ready to learn a little bit about Martha, Mary's sister? Martha said to Jesus, she's run out to meet him. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She has that much faith in him. If you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. I know him. But even now, I know whatever you ask from God, God will give it to you. Is your hope gone? <laughs> Martha's like, even now, I know, I know you. You raised the widow of Nain's son. You healed the centurion's, this was in Luke, but she, she still knew about it. She, you healed the centurion's servant from a distance. You raised Jairus's daughter. This has all happened. She knows he can do this. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day, which tells you what? They believed in the resurrection. This is not a new concept, just for the church. And Jesus said to her, he has not said this to anyone else. He says it to Mar Martha, on a road, by himself, just the two of them. He scandalizes himself with Martha and Mary all the time, doesn't he? And what does he say to her? I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. 
Do you believe this? He has not said this to the guys. He chooses Martha on a road by herself. Her husband's, I mean, her husband, her brother's dead. Her sister Mary's having a little sulk back at the house, which is understandable. I shouldn't defame Mary. I don't know what her heart was. He just told her he was the resurrection and the life. Like, this is the gospel. I think Jesus trusted women. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. I just got shivers again. I don't know how many times I read this. This is what Martha should be remembered for. Why do we remember her for being the busybody, no good, very bad, I don't want to be her? I want to be this Martha, right? She has way more verses here than two in Luke 7, or Luke 10, rather. This is who I want to be. When she'd said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher's here and he is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. And now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. She was, he, they were away. He wanted a time alone with these women whom he loved and he cared for. He didn't want to be in the mess of the throng of all the, the people that were there mourning with her. Because we soon learn that there are some friends, but a lot of foes. Jesus' foes in that group. He wants his intimate time when God calls you aside. Mary, Jeannie, Wandy, come. I want to console you off to the side, away from everybody else. Right? So they had time together, and that was really lovely. Um, when the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out. They followed her, supposing that she was going to, where, to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. That's her place. Saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. What did Martha just said? That's how Martha introduced her her comments. If you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, Mary, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And there you have the shortest, most famous, second most famous term, scripture, Jesus wept. And we don't know why he was weeping. Was he weeping because Lazarus had died? Was he weeping because of the pain of sin and death that is visited upon people? He's in the midst of suffering. Right now, we're going through some really hard times with my mom. She's 91. She's been great. She's on the decline. She's now not remembering who we are. It's, we're coming to the end. And it's a hard time, especially for my, my girls, my little girls. And Jesus is in the presence of that. He is in the midst of the, what Adam and, and Eve did. He brought this death and this sin and this brokenness and this pain into the world that shouldn't be there. It wasn't how it was meant to be. And he came specifically to get rid of it. And it breaks his heart. I, he wasn't weeping because Lazarus had died. He was weeping because of the pain and the suffering that, it, that death causes. And the decay, as we are all growing younger, and we're feeling stronger, and our joints ache less, and we can see brilliantly, right? As I tiptoe into that world, I think I had my first hot flash last week. Um, that is the result of sin and death, and that's what broke his heart. It breaks his heart, right? 
So the Jews said, oh, see how he loved him. Like normal, they got a little wrong. But some of them said, could, he, could not he who opened the eyes of a blind man also have kept this man from dying? What's that in comparison to how Martha and Mary responded? If you'd been there, I know he wouldn't have died. And these Jews are like, what? He healed the blind man. What's going on? Why can't he heal this guy? Why didn't he stop it? So there's doubt here. Is it two different? Do you see those two different postures? They're two different postures. Why didn't he do that instead of, I know you could have done it? Where's your posture? What posture do you have to God? Why are you doing this to me? Or, I know you want my best. I trust you no matter what. We all should be here. I do spend some time here. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor for he's been dead for four days. She's still quite not, quite not grasping it, but she's worried, like, oh, it's, gonna, it's overpowering. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Like, Martha, I just said that to you, right? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe you sent me. And this is what Martha and Mary witness. Imagine being in that crowd. The pictures of um, this are great. But look, so you see, look where Martha is in white. Mary is actually conflated with Mary Magdalene. Giotto got that a little wrong. Mary of Magdalene, Mary and Bethany were the same person. So she's wearing red, she's just in the back. And you see um, some of the guys in the back are covering their, mouth, their mouths, like, ooh, I don't want to smell him. There are the Jews going, what's going on? What's happening? Ooh. Oh, this is one of my favorites. This is by Van Gogh. Did you know that Van Gogh had been a priest? He had been, he had been a priest. He was a failed priest. He was a miserable priest. He loved God, and he was a Catholic priest. And he worked with the miners. He, and he painted a lot of the potato people because they were so poor, all they could afford was potatoes. So all through his life, he you know, went a little nuts. He left the priesthood. I don't know if they, I can't remember if they defrocked him or if he defrocked himself, but he was not a very good priest. But he loved God, and he was very devout Catholic. Um, then he went a little nuts, um, as we know, but he painted. And this is his, Laz that's Martha in green and Mary on this side. Um, and that is in uh, Amsterdam in the uh, Van Gogh Museum. So many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and seen what he did, believed in him. They'd come with Mary, so they were consoling Mary, and many of them believed. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And the Pharisees were like, got ya. This is blasphemous. Because he basically just told the crowd, I'm the son of God, right? He told the whole crowd, I'm the son of God. Only I can bring people back from the dead, which is forgiving all their sin, their sin to death. Half the crowd was wowed, and the other half the crowd was mad. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered to the council and said, what are we to do for this man performs many signs? And we know how it ends. It doesn't end well for Jesus, but then it ends really well for Jesus, right? It ends really well for us. So that was the aha moment where they got him. And please remember Martha from that, please. But back to Mary, because <laughs> I know this about Mary. Um, so she then, we, then we go pretty much directly to John 12. So this has all happened, and we go straight to John 12. This is Mary and her nard. Um, 
So just wanted to review the women who, uh, Mary, who anointed Jesus. These are all the women who, who anoint Jesus. The sinful woman in Luke 7, 38, which I talked to you about, that most people collab, conflate Mary Magdalene with. Matthew 26, 6 through 13, Jesus Jesus's head was anointed at Bethany just before the betrayal. So that's in Matthew. Matthew make, has, says he anoints the head. Mark um, is at the home of Simon and Leper. Jesus's head is anointed at Bethany just before betrayal. Um, so they're all unnamed. All the anointing women are unnamed except for in John 12. And it's just following this. The interesting thing is she anoints him for his burial, but he had just reversed the burial of her brother. She had probably five days before anointed her brother for burial in the same way, but he was dead. And here's Mary anointing him for burial. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus would, whom Jesus raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there, Martha served. There we are. She's serving him. And that's a good thing here. And Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. <coughs> Mary, therefore, took a pound, a pound, a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples whom he was about to betray, who was about to betray him, said, why has, was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And he said this because he cared not about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag he used to help himself to what was put in it. And Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. This is a huge juxtaposition, these two. Right? So you have Mary, who's just obviously had a long-term relationship with Jesus, obviously had been his disciple. He'd risked his reputation very early on by teaching her. She chose the good portion. Right? She is this woman who just had her brother raised from the dead. I'm not sure. But if you had been, if your sibling had died, and four days after he died, Jesus came and rose him from the dead, raised him from the dead, and you had to take off the cloths, what would you be thinking? Like, put yourself there. What are you thinking? Like, holy smokes, this guy can do anything, right? Like, wow, he can do anything. I owe him everything. Everything. I owe him everything. The nard, the pound, is supposed to be about um, $8,000, $9,000 worth of perfume in today's money. That was, um, you know, yeah, a lot, a lot, enough to feed a lot of people. Mary willingly gives it to him. Judas selfishly <coughs> scolds her. And there's a lot that can be said about this, but I look at, I, I was thinking about it a lot this morning. And Mary gave the best and maybe everything to Jesus first. And Judas was like, well, it, it, he was obviously being selfish, but it can be given. We can use this to help a lot of people. And that is super important, right? But it's this, I was realizing this is about serving God first before you get busy serving God's people, right? Putting your heart and serving God's first is what Mary did. Her whole heart was oriented toward her. She was extravagant in her worship of God, of Jesus. And that was her first thought. He, because he 
Do you think he could feed all those people, the poor? Do you think he could feed the poor? I think with the feeding of the 5,000, we kind of already saw that, right? He can do that. She gave everything to him. And then he will give everything to whomever he need, it needs to go. If you're running around over here, in a way, it's like, it's what we see, think of Martha and Mary. You can run around and, help and do a lot of good, but what does that have to do with God? Give your heart and everything fully to him first and foremost. And he will take care of it. I don't know if that's tithing. I don't know. You know, I'd rather buy a cute outfit than tithe. 10% gross plus. Um, but that's not the call. That's not Mary's call. He literally has raised you all from the dead. Do you realize that? When we pass from this reality, what happens to us? If you call Jesus Lord, you are resurrected. He has already, in the big scheme of things, raised you from the dead. How do you respond to that? Right? It's hard for me to think about. But yet, I really want these shoes. I mean, it's not saying don't get shoes, right? But you're first in your whole heart. And I'm speaking as much to me as to anybody here. And this is not the talk at all that I had planned. <laughs> right? I, I did not come here with these words in my mind. So I think the Holy Spirit is trying to tell me something. I've got to give it all to him. And he will give it all back in spades. He gives me my life back. I get the resurrection out of the deal. <laughs> Who's the winner there? That is a fair trade. All right. So Mary of Bethany, she's pretty amazing. Martha's pretty cool too. She's Laz sister of Lazarus and Martha. She's a woman who knew Jesus, who was a disciple of Jesus, who washed Jesus' feet, who prepared Jesus for burial. And we're still talking about her today. Lord Jesus, thank you for your servant Mary. Thank you that for um, how you called her, how you changed her heart. Thank you for her faith and her devotion. As we learn from you, Father, I pray that Mary's um, actions seek deep into our hearts, that we would choose the good portion, that we would trust you and have hope in you to know that you can do anything, and that we would give our all first and foremost to you. Thank you, Lord, for her, and I pray that you would bless these women with your grace and your peace with the delight of the day in this resurrection season. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks, ladies. <laughs>